It's not necessarily a personal thing when veterans go against rookies. It's just playing good basketball. If you think if there's going to be a player most likely to be rattled, right, it would be a rookie. But this is my point about Angel Reese, which is that she does not let herself get rattled which in and of itself is a veteran trait. What she's doing is she's kind of doing stuff that like Alyssa Thomas, for example, has been doing very well for years. She's not getting rattled. She's drawing fouls. She's getting herself into jump ball situations, gets her way to the free throw line. And that's what I mean about team impact, all of the little things. I, I think that's, that's what people are liking from Angel Reese. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of The Late Sub. I am your host, Claire Watkins. It is Tuesday, May 28th. I hope everyone had a wonderful holiday weekend in the U.S., and we have a lot to talk about. Another really great week of WNBA action. We've got NWSL bellwether teams rising and falling as we move closer to the Olympic period. We've got a little bit of U.S. Women's National Team to talk about. We've got a lot going on in the world of women's sports, so let's dig in. Okay, first off this week, let's talk WNBA. Another really exciting week of action. I've been enjoying this season a lot so far. I think it's been a really nice mix of sort of players taking a step forward from year to year. We're seeing the rookie class make a big impact already. We're seeing some of these known stars keep their level up. I do always think that say this in soccer, I think it's true for basketball too. It's an Olympic year. So I think everyone has big, big goals. I've just really been enjoying things. I think that sometimes the dub gets in danger of being a little bit repetitive with only being a 12 team league. And we have not hit that point yet. And I think we're not going to hit that point for some time. So have really been enjoying the action, some quick hits of some overall league status type stuff. And then we'll get into the more individual picture. Connecticut is the only unbeaten team left in the league at five zero. Now we are recording on Tuesday. They do play the Mercury tonight. So who knows by the time this comes out, this might be obsolete, but Connecticut has looked very resilient in a couple pretty close games. I think three, Three of those five have been pretty close. They look like a, a very good team to have to play against and a very difficult team to beat. On the other end, Washington is the only team without a win so far at zero and six. Indiana and LA both have one win, though, again, they play each other tonight on Tuesday. So one of those records will change. Minnesota is still kind of the big positive surprise. They sit at 4-1 right now. Vegas, the only other one-loss team at 3-1. Everyone else still kind of figuring out their form. They're in the middle. We've seen some teams kind of get the better of other teams. We've seen some surprising wins, but not necessarily consistency. So I think we have, we're seeing sort of this top of the league where we kind of expect it to be, like I said, Minnesota, a really, really nice surprise, but you expect Vegas to be there. You expect Connecticut to be there. At the bottom, you see the Mystics maybe struggling a little bit more than people anticipated, but we know that they are working on the big picture. Indiana and LA, I think two other teams that people expected to have some major learning curve going into this season. But I want to talk about, again, just some, we're going to talk about all of these teams, but we're going to talk about them in the lens of individual performances, because I do think at the beginning of a season like this, you see more individuals popping up, breaking out making an impact, making a difference as teams kind of get their rotation and their schemes together by mid-season. So we're going to do, again, just a way too soon MVP watch. We're going to start with some fresh faces. We're going to start not talking about the big three from last year. We will get to them in a second. I want to shout out Kalia Copper, absolute breakout start in her first season with the Phoenix Mercury. She leads the league in scoring at 29.2 points per game. She's third in the league in three-pointers made. Phoenix in general is looking really promising so far. They got a marquee win over Vegas last week. They've got the offense cooking, even while having to play small ball without Brittany Griner. I think that Copper is not only just playing very well, but she's also shining in their system, which makes you feel like these performances can be replicated. Now, is she going to be hitting career highs every single week? I don't know. Maybe that would be incredible to see. But it does seem like she has a very clear role within the Phoenix system. And again, like I said, they're having to play small ball. They're having to play very quickly. They're having to keep teams honest from behind the arc, which is, like I said, she's third and three-pointers made. She's working very well off of Diana Taurasi and Sophie Cunningham and Natasha Cloud, who has had a very good start to the season as well. I'm liking what I'm seeing from Phoenix and specifically liking what I'm seeing from Kalia Copper. I don't think she's in that MIP conversation because she was already a huge star leaving the sky going to Phoenix. But Incredible stuff from her. Love to see her take that next step forward. Nafisa Collier in Minnesota. If Minnesota keeps getting the wins that they've been getting early in the season, I think Collier is going to be in this MVP mix. She's got 23 points per game, 10.4 rebounds per game. She currently leads the league in steals. So this is an all-around player. You know, I think always when you talk about MVP, we talk about 
offensive output versus defensive output, who is the best overall all around player in the league. Collier, I think has this, this early argument for she's scoring at the other end. She's playing very good defense. She's got the rebounds to show for it. She's got the steals to show for it. And her team is winning in a way that is perhaps surprising people. So when you talk about valuable, I think everyone sort of has different philosophies about what creates an MVP. Collier is part of that conversation, not only because of what she's able to do individually, but also the impact she's having on a team that is surprising people. Another player I want to shout out sort of in that same conversation, but maybe flipped is Arike Ogumbawale. Always feels like her MVP candidacy is dependent specifically on how Dallas is doing as a team because the stats are there. The stats are always there, right? Like people know that Arike Ogumbawale is a very, very good scorer. They know that she can be very clutch in the fourth quarter. She's a great clutch player. She's got 28.8 points per game. She's top five in three points made and top five in steals. She, though, however, sometimes is seen sort of as a, yes, she gets stats, but what does what is the team doing? What does the team need? How is this star player being managed in a way that's best for her entire team? I think, or I would like to see, let's say this, I would like to see Dallas take a big step forward this year. I think they have the right group to do it. They've been dealing with some injuries, but also some of their replacement players. You talk about Monique Billings. We're seeing really, really nice things from them, from their bigs. I'd like to think that there's room this season in particular for Dallas to maintain their dominance inside and in the post while also letting Agumba Wale do what she does best, especially in the fourth quarter. Would love to see her be that kind of player where she's basing her her play on team needs in the first three quarters, and then maybe she gets a little bit more of a green light in the fourth. They get a couple more wins. I think she should be in this conversation. So love watching her game. I think that she's the kind of player that casuals really like to watch, but there is always that question of what does it mean for her team? What does it mean for her win percentage? So those are, those are some of the early players. I think I, I missed this. I missed last week, Derek Hamby, who I think is also playing quite well. I think LA is sort of in a, a tricky spot. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, which is just Hamby's personal ambitions might just be tempered by the fact that LA is still very much in a rebuilding year. But I also want to just go back to last year's big three because they keep coming to play. I mean, Asia Wilson, in my opinion, through the first couple weeks of the season is still the MVP front runner. She's third in points per game. She's second in rebounds per game. She's tied for fourth in blocks. I think she has been the best overall player on the court in the first two weeks. I think that her value to the team has only become more important as Vegas has been dealing with some, some defensive issues. They're having trouble dominating so much on defense as they were last year. They're finding themselves sort of in grinds. They're finding themselves in these games where they have to up their level a little bit to keep getting those wins. I like what we're seeing from Asia Wilson. And I think I keep saying this. I think she's going to be more important to this team than ever. And she is the perfect kind of all around player that you look for in an MVP candidate. Though, however, I do want to shout out teammate, her teammate, Jackie Young, Jackie Young, quiet assassin. She has been also very, very good so far to start the season. I do wonder sometimes when you have a number of very good players on one team, as Vegas does, if that impacts the MVP conversation because you say, oh, well, this player couldn't do this without them. They couldn't do it without them. Does that split voting? Though obviously Young and Wilson have very different roles on that team. But yeah, I, I am curious to see if sort of the emergence of a player like Young or the continued excellence of a player like Young does impact the MVP conversation for Wilson. I think famously everyone remembers that Wilson had one fourth place vote last year, but I think what people forget is that that fourth place vote was in favor of her teammate Chelsea Gray for third so I do always wonder if a team cohesion or other players stepping up does impact a player's MVP candidacy Alyssa Thomas has had something of a strange week and we will talk about that a little bit later but she's also continuing to excel at her very specific set of skills she is averaging near a triple double already 15.4 points per game 9.6 rebounds and 7.8 assists She is the triple-double queen. She is the all-around player that Connecticut needs, and her team is winning. She is galvanizing her teammates. I do think that her winning or not winning MVP so much depends on, again, on what individual voters value. If they think that that sort of all-around excellence matches up with some of the higher point totals that you see from other players or some of the defensive dominance specifically that you see from other players. Again, Thomas has a lot of help with with players like Brianna Jones and Dewana Bonner on her team, but she's just been her exact same self. Her consistency has been incredible despite, like I said, having kind of a, an up and down week, which we will get to in a little bit. It's been a slower start for Brianna Stewart. Stewie is getting rebounds just like she always does, but the scoring hasn't quite been there in the first couple of weeks as the Liberty sort of figure out how to compete or maybe rise to the competition level. A couple of teams have made the Liberty look kind of slow in recent weeks. They had kind of that big upset to Chicago, that loss. 
kind of made them look a little bit slow on the uptake. The season is long, but not sort of that bounce back that you necessarily expect from a finals loss. Or maybe it is sort of the struggles that you maybe expect after a finals loss. Curious to see at what point Stewart can try to turn it on. We even saw it within one game this week. It was a, a loss to Minnesota by New York where very, very slow start by the Liberty. They looked very poor over the first one and a half quarters. And then Stewart just kind of flips the switch, turns it on. They tie the game. They do not ultimately go on to win. But I think Stewie is always that player where you always know that it's in her. It's possible for her to take over a game. But how does she do that day in and day out while also turning that Liberty team into a cohesive unit? Because I think that's just going to continue to be the conversation for the rest of the season. So that's kind of the larger MVP race. Some of these established veterans who are taking those steps forward, who are surprising, whose teams are doing well. And then also some big stars that you would expect to see in that conversation. But let's talk about rookies. I, you know, I think maybe people are getting tired of the constant focus on the rookies, but some of these rookies are also in top five for stats. Some of these rookies are playing like veteran players. Some of these rookies are looking like it's not their first year in the league. It's their fifth. It's their sixth. We're seeing different kinds of impact from the rookie class. So I really enjoy talking about these guys because I think they all bring different things to their teams and they we're seeing a number of players have legitimate arguments for, for that early part of the Rookie of the Year race. So we're going to start with Kagan Clark. Kind of always begins and ends with Clark, right? She leads rookies in scoring. She's averaging 15.4 points per game. She's fourth in the league in assists with 6.3 assists per game. She's shooting 37.1% from the field, which is not bad for an, a WNBA guard let alone a rookie. Those percentages are going to go up and down, but that efficiency is pretty standard for a veteran level guard in the WNBA. She's having a good season. I think people notice some of the struggles that Indiana are having as a team, some of that sort of isolated ball, individual performances, but they're starting to get, they're starting to figure it out a little bit. We're seeing some lineup changes. We're seeing a little bit more cohesion. I think Clark already has a, a really nice rapport with Thag Benle, who is their other kind of power forward. There's their center who actually got the start alongside Aliyah Boston in their most recent game. Clark is having a good season. And I think it's just because she already sort of looks like maybe your standard WNBA guard that, that people are looking for her to be maybe better or worse than she actually is. But this is a very solid start to a rookie season. I think your a direct competition would or direct comp comparison would be like someone like Sabrina Unescu. They have very similar points per game, very similar field goal percentages. I think you're seeing them kind of play defense in a similar way. So if you've got Caitlin Clark already sort of with a direct comp to a player like Unescu, that's great in her first season on a team like Indiana that's still figuring it out. They are finishing up a very grueling start to their season. I think with more practice time, they're going to start to look a little bit better. But yeah, I, I think that if you're looking at who immediately is making the largest statistical impact on a team that requires a lot of help from the player bringing the ball up the court, got to look at Clark. However, some other players with some nice arguments early on, Cameron Brink in LA. Brink leads the league in blocks. She leads rookies in rebounds per game. And she just most recently had her big scoring breakout game against Dallas with 21 points. For me, what's setting Brink apart is her ability to run the floor. And that is not something that every power forward even or center in the league can do. She's so fast. And she can exploit a lack of pace against other teams. So her pace and transition, both on offense and on defense, we saw that at that Dallas game where she played so well, it caused problems for the Dallas's bigs. She can hit just enough long jumpers and three-pointers to keep her defenders having to think about chasing her around rather than getting settled in the paint. She moves very quickly on defense. She gets settled in her defensive stance very fast. And I think that that's not a pace of play. We always talk about the pace of play being faster in the dub. It is easier sometimes for big players to adjust to the pace of play than it is for guards. Guards just have to be so quick trigger, so quick. But Brink is kind of actually bringing that energy to her role as a, as, as a big player for LA. It's impressive to watch. And I think you are seeing it again. You're seeing it in blocks. When a player like Brink gets blocks, it's not just that she has the length, but it's also that, yeah, she's set in her defensive stance. She's set up in where she wants to be on the court to be best positioned to defend inside. Foul trouble has been consistent for her, but that's expected. I think she's in an interesting place where maybe she should start to trust her stand-up defense a little bit more, not always go for the block, put the players against her in difficult percentage positions, make them take worse shots, let those shots not fall, grab the rebound. Again, I think you talk about direct comp and stats. She's she's like somewhere near around where Aaliyah Boston is performing so far this season. I think that's a good, good direct comp, at least sort of in what we're seeing in the box score. But I really do think what's setting Brink apart is her pace, 
and her ability to make those long jumpers, make those three-pointers. Now, I'm not saying that her field goal percentage is going to light up the league, but when you have a player of her profile, if she can do that, that's that stretch big that they want her to turn into. And already we're seeing her ability to do that at the pro level. Really impressive. I have some larger thoughts about LA, which I will get to a little bit later, but they have to be really, really happy with what they've seen with Brink. But now I want to talk about, maybe this is the player of the moment this week, the one who kind of caused a lot of discussion, a lot of people really liking what they're seeing from her, is Angel Reese in Chicago. What a week for Angel Reese. She's kind of showing both on and off the court what she brings to a team. Because I think the biggest argument for Reese in terms of talking about that rookie of the year or even just talking, you know, all rookie team, that kind of a thing, is more about team impact necessarily than just box score and just individual stats. Stats wise, not doing poorly at all. Her rebounding has been good. Her defense has been good. I think when you go into advanced stats, just watching her play, I think you would see that she gets a lot of deflections that maybe don't necessarily are called rebounds. She gets deflections that are not necessarily called assists. She's doing all of the little things right. And it is turning Chicago as a team into more of a contender for a playoff spot than I think people expected. The Sky are currently tied for first in the league in offensive rebounds, primarily powered by Reese and Elizabeth Williams, who is a very underrated center. Again, Williams actually, again, player profile, very similar to how Reese is playing right now, which is that she's not always the best rim finisher, but everything else is there. Deflections, rebounds, steals, blocks. She's a perfect center for turning defense into offense, which is what Chicago wants to do. They want to move the ball very, very quickly. Now, Reese's field goal percentage probably should be a little bit better based on the powerful forward role that she plays. She doesn't have a field goal percentage of someone that you usually would see finishing high efficiency around the rim. That that long shoulder, like again, moving back, back to what, maybe what Brink has that maybe Reese doesn't have just yet. She doesn't really have the mid range, doesn't really have the three point. You're seeing teams not really have to defend that much. And she's also very unwilling to take those shots that will come. But again, Chicago is a team that's based on on these very fundamental roles. You know, Reese and Ewell, they rebound. They, they play that defense. They get the ball back out. Marina Mabry is the sky's primary outside shooter. Kennedy Carter is kind of their energizer bunny off the bench. I think they just have very clear roles, and that's how they've been able to gel so quickly. The team overall probably also needs to shoot better. They had a very close loss to Connecticut this weekend, and if they kind of hit their bunnies, if they hit the shots that they are generating, both in transition offense and in these offensive rebounds, I think that they will be a team very difficult to beat. But let's talk about the big thing that happened with Angel Reese this weekend. Yes, we are going to have to talk about the Alyssa Thomas choke slam. So the Sun played the Sky on Saturday. It was a very close game. The Sky have the advantage at the half. The Sun come back to win it in the second half. It's a very physical matchup between two teams. I mean, I, I know that Connecticut has an elite front court, but the Sky would like to also be that team. Now, the Sky don't have Camilla Cardoso. They don't have Izzy Harrison. A lot of the responsibility to battle in the front court against Brianna Jones and Alyssa Thomas falls on Williams and Reese. Late in the third quarter, the physicality goes up a notch. Angel Reese spends one attacking possession by the Sky on the ground after being kind of jostled under the rim on defense trying to go for a rebound. When the Sun come back on offense, they throw up a shot. Shot is missed. Alyssa Thomas and Angel Reese both go for a rebound. And Alyssa Thomas, again, I just want to speak very physically, just literally about what happened. Alyssa Thomas throws Reese to the ground by the neck when they are competing for a rebound. Thomas is given a flagrant two. She's ejected from the game. Strangely enough, this actually kind of galvanizes the Sun. The Sun play very well for the rest of the game. Dewana Bonner goes off. Dijanae Carrington, just as good as ever. They do actually win this game after Thomas is ejected. But it was sort of an interesting like friction point or tension point of this early season, especially when considering all of these larger narratives at play about this rookie class and about veterans and about what it looks like for a rookie to kind of have their welcome to the league moment and what it means for veterans to want to kind of impose themselves on rookies to kind of go at rookies. It's not necessarily a personal thing when veterans go against rookies. It's just playing good basketball. If you think if there's going to be a player most likely to be rattled, right, it would be a rookie. But this is my point about Angel Reese, which is that she does not let herself get rattled which in and of itself is a veteran trait. I'm not going to place intent on Thomas either way. I've seen some people say she didn't mean to do it. I've seen other people say it was intentional. Not going to make that statement definitively. I don't think that's fair to anybody, but I do think it was accumulative. I was at this game. I covered this game and I the, the media is situated on the side of the court 
where the foul occurred. So I saw not only what was happening when the sky was on offense on that side of the court, but also when the sun was on offense in the second half. Reese had been getting under Thomas's skin the whole game. It just, it was happening. There were specifically two jump balls in the first half that Reese earned that Thomas clearly believed to be fouls. I think you can, again, I, I'm not really placing like any judgment on that. You could say that the refs weren't in control. You could maybe say that, you know, Reese was just sort of playing her own level of physicality. Reese would then go ahead and win those jumps after the whistle. So she would win these jump balls. Thomas would feel like they were overly physical. And then afterwards, Reese would get the ball back. She would actually maintain possession for the sky on those jumps. By the end of the first half, Thomas and Reese, I, I have a very clear picture in my mind of Thomas and Reese. They're standing next to each other during a, a free throw taken by the sky and they're chatting. They're chatting a little bit. It was a point where, you know, I think sometimes you see teams. It was funny when I was watching this guy play the Liberty earlier this week, I was like, oh, these teams don't have beef. I don't think they are noticing each other at all. But but Thomas and Reese, they they were talking a little bit. They were they were chattering a little bit. And so I, I don't think that foul was like some sort of a, a message or a personal vendetta. But in a way, I think Reese earned that by working hard and getting into those deflection moments, getting into those jump ball moments. And I mean that like positively in that big win against New York that this guy got, she did the same kind of thing to John Quell Jones. Jones got into foul trouble very early, completely took her out of the game. Reese draws those fouls and not just shooting fouls, but off ball fouls. She's very good at drawing off ball fouls, reshape the course of a game. If a player gets into foul trouble, and so I think more than anything, rather than being like, this is veterans versus rookies, and I think everyone saw Reese's very good statement about the game afterwards, not personal at all, all just part of the game for them. But what she's doing is she's kind of doing stuff that like Alyssa Thomas, for example, has been doing very well for years. She's not getting rattled. She's drawing fouls. She's getting herself into jump ball situations, and she makes gets her way to the free throw line. And that's what I mean about team impact, all of the little things that make Reese a very exciting player. And perhaps again, when you look at maybe Chicago's ability to win games versus again, Brink or, or Clark who are on teams that are, are having a lot of trouble winning games. So again, there have been some very different schedule situations for, for each of these teams. I, I think that's, that's what people are liking, I guess, from Angel Reese. And we actually had a listener question, shout out to John, who sent us this question just about sort of that retroactive look at the draft, right? And I think some people thought that Reese kind of fell in the draft, right? She goes seventh. There was a question of, of these other power forwards that were taken before Reese. So maybe LA taking Rakia Jackson or even the Mystics taking Aaliyah Edwards. Now, I, I'm going to do the thing that I always do, which is that I don't think it's one-to-one, -one, but kind of player need and player fit. Let's talk about Jackson first. Rakia Jackson in LA. I think Rakia Jackson is fantastic and actually has been playing very, very well, but she's had limited minutes. She is not starting. She's coming off of the bench and she is contributing with high efficiency in those, those minutes. If you look at her point to minute ratio, it's very, very good. Now, this is my thing with the Sparks that I don't understand. And, and you know, I, I, you know, Kurt Miller, he's an established coach in this league, not, not going up against Kurt too much, but hey, I know they don't need another power forward starting when they have Hamby and they have Brink. But also, like, figure it out. Maybe you drafted these two really, really good rookies. You're seeing Jackson play very well coming off of the bench, but she isn't given the time that Brink and Reese are being given to impact games the way that I think that she can, which then just leads to that question of what are LA's goals out of this season? Talk about Chicago, right? They are starting Reese. I believe when Camilla Cardoso comes back, she is also going to be getting serious minutes. Chicago has no reason to tank this year. They have no reason to not want to win every single game they can possibly win because they have a, a swap, a pick swap with Dallas in 2025. So if Chicago falls into the lottery this season, Dallas gets that spot. Dallas gets that pick. They do not want to fall into the lottery. There is no world where tanking works out in Chicago's favor. So you're going to see players like Reese want to impact wins. You're going to see Cardoso want to impact wins. They don't want to be in the lottery because that does not serve them at all. LA, a little bit different. LA might actually serve them to develop these rookies and maybe go after a guard, right? They've got these really nice bigs, but what does their, what does their backcourt look like, right? I think so that the goals are a little bit different. But then I would say, well, if that's the goal, develop Jackson, get her in there, <laughs> figure out what you're going to do. <laughs> go, go, go all big, go all big. Who cares? So, so that's my take on LA and that's my take on Jackson. I don't think that LA made a mistake. I also think that Aaliyah Edwards has been looking just as much like a pro as Reese has, but again, just sort of fewer pieces around her in Washington to make the same full team impact. And she is just simply not playing as much, which maybe leads to my final thought on Reese and maybe a larger thought about these rookies. 
which is that I just think Angel Reese playing under Teresa Weatherspoon is a particularly good fit. And I don't know if she would be doing as well under a different coach. Weatherspoon has instilled her team with a lot of belief. She's a very good one-on-one coach. If you see her drill with those players, she is very clear in her instructions. She's very clear in her instructions to Reese mid-game, and Reese is listening. The assistant coaching staff in Chicago is actually quite good as well. And Reese is being given a lot of minutes on the court to figure out how to best impact a game. And she's learning alongside Elizabeth Williams, who I think is like the perfect mentor for a player like Reese. But that leads to me to be, I think everyone has landed in a pretty good spot. You know, Clark is where she needs to be to truly be able not only to impact this team to start, but like figure out where the gaps are and figure out how Indiana can become a playoff contender with a player like Clark. You look at the success that Brink is having. And like I said, even just early Rakia Jackson, I think we're seeing the the future of LA. I think that they are very, very happy there. Talk about a different type of player. Talk about Kate Martin in Vegas, right? That's been a great situation for Martin. Martin's getting minutes because of the injuries that the team has suffered. And she's turned into this nice kind of all around player for them. She gets some buckets. She gets some stops. I do think Vegas needs to get taller. And this does lead us to our first, first round cut of this season, which is Daisha fair did not, or she is no longer on the Vegas roster. She was cut this week. She was waived. I think she is a casualty of Vegas's needs. They need to get taller and they need to find a replacement level defender, which unfortunately just did not match fair's physical or player profile. I would like to think she will land on her feet somewhere else, but I just think that we're seeing like, if there's any player that did not have that right, who does not have that right fit because Vegas went with best, best player available and it didn't work out for them. It would be a player like fair. But I'm really liking what I'm seeing from everybody else. And again, even if not every team is going to be winning every single game, I think it makes things incredibly compelling because there are so many storylines here to to follow and to follow well. So I, I've really enjoyed so far what's going on in the dub. And I just do not think that the rookie of the year conversation will be going away anytime soon, just like MVP. So moving on to NWSL. Now, the U.S. did drop a roster late last week. If you would like to see a full deep dive analysis of that, go to the Just Women's Sports YouTube channel. We did a YouTube exclusive version of the late sub only talking about the United States. So if you missed that, go over to YouTube, give that a watch, give that a listen. But I want to talk about NWSL because it was a big, big weekend in NWSL. Big picture. It is kind of funny to me. This is the first year in NWSL where there are eight playoff spots, which is the most playoff spots in league history. It was four for a long time, then it moved to six. Now it moved to eight. But this is one of those seasons, you know, last year, if you're following the NWSL last year, you had kind of a couple teams rising towards the top, but it was very, very close in all of those, like I said, six playoff spots that they had last year. You had teams divided by very few points. The shield was not determined until the last game of the season. The playoff position was not determined until the last game of the season. We saw one result, that one Angel City result, throw them into playoff position when they were not in playoff position before. That was the kind of season we saw last year. This year, it is already kind of feeling like the natural order of things is leaning towards a traditional top four. Traditional kind of top four or five. I think I'm going to cite out five teams that I think are are top four quality. And we're also seeing maybe the floor drop out a little bit at the bottom. And we're seeing wider chasms this season than we did last year. And I, I think this is very natural in an expansion year. But I think also just some of these teams are playing really, really well. Sometimes a really competitive season is very exciting because you don't know what's going to happen. But you also don't necessarily feel like there was one like best team that really put it all together. And I think we saw that last year, both in our Shield winner with San Diego and with the championship winner being Gotham, who kind of snuck into the playoffs before going on to win the championship. This year, it's a little bit closer to what you consider to be a traditional top four, top five. So I want to talk about these top teams that that I feel very, very good about. We're going to just kind of hit them quickly because there are a lot of teams here to shout out. I think the Orlando Pride have an argument for best team in the NWSL. Crazy to say out loud, but what's true is true. Barbara Banda is playing like an MVP. Marta is playing like a player completely rejuvenated. I've really liked what we've seen from Marta so far this season because it just feels like she no longer feels like she has to do it all. She's finding players. She's bringing the ball up and dropping it off to the attackers. She's putting, she put the most beautiful ball together for Barbara Banda on one of their goals this weekend. I love to see Marta feel like she doesn't have to take over a game because she has the pieces in Orlando around her. That makes me so happy. The defense has been strong. I think they play very beautiful attacking football, even when they, before they got the breakthrough against Portland, they were hammering the opponent's box. Very, very nice from them. I think Adriana has been just as good as ever. They're still missing a couple of great midfielders. 
I mean, maybe we go, maybe we go back to this podcast at the end of the season and maybe I'm real wrong, but I just think with the pride of staying power and that's why they're breaking records. They're breaking win streak records. And obviously Banda puts them over the top. I don't think anybody's questioning that, but you go back to the beginning of the season when they were not dropping points, or at least they were not losing games while waiting for that one perfect striker. They've just put a really nicely balanced team together. And number two, Kansas City is not going away. I keep waiting for the Kansas City current to stumble, and they just haven't yet. They'll be really happy to have Bia back full-time. She's still working her way back from injury. They might actually, unfortunately, have suffered a different injury, a defender injury to Gabby Robinson in this week's game. There was an off-ball moment where she went down. It looked like maybe, hopefully not, but maybe an Achilles issue. Felt very, very bad for Gabby Robinson, who I've spoken about before. I think she's done so well this season. But they're very resilient. Kansas City, very resilient. I think they, they won this game by way of Elizabeth Ball. They're getting goal scorers. I think it's been a league record. I, I forget exactly the number, but they have a league record of goal scorers this year. They are getting results from the whole team. And they have not been perfect there in their injury report. They have been dealing with injuries. They have been having players in and out. But if you are getting that kind of contribution from everybody on your team, that is a team that is bought in, resilient, and well-coached. Still really like the Kansas City Current. I think they're this kind of top four quality. The Washington Spirit. They're coming for you. That's what I have in my notes. The Washington Spirit are coming for you. For my money, some of the nicest football you'll see in the league. Croy Bethune is going to break single season records this year. I think she's well on track to break the single season assist record. She, she's feeling like this sort of Candace Parker-like player in the NWSL. She's a real MVP candidate in her first year. Definitely a rookie of the year front runner by way of the, the normal rules for rookie of being a player coming out of college. But she is in the top five in the MVP race right now. I think, you know, we'll talk about that more formally, but I think there are a number of players on the spirit who are who are in that in that conversation. And I think they're a team that prioritizes individual strengths and we do see individual brilliance from this team, but they also have a pretty sturdy system that allows them to defend. They were not perfect at all against the rain this week, but I think you're seeing them get those wins because they at least can put themselves out in front. I think they're playing very well with Star as a target striker. I really like their two defensive midfielder setup. And I think that they're pulling huge crowds at Audi Field. They've got Geraldes on his way. This is kind of the dream that Michelle Kang has been pushing for for the spirit. And it's been really cool to see it happen so quickly. So love, love what we're seeing from Washington. Now, Portland, big high profile loss this weekend. They, they lose to Orlando. I think everyone had this circled on their calendars. Two very good teams. Not everyone can win. I still think Portland is a top four, top five talent. But I think a very good example this weekend of what Sophia Smith brings to the team. She was not available due to a lower leg knock. And they just don't look the same without her. They just don't look the same without her. I mean, I know we say something like, you know, Orlando doesn't look the same without Banda, but Portland just doesn't have the ability to press in the same way. They don't need to keep the defense honest in the same way when they move the ball quickly. They, the other teams don't have to respect the defensive press and they do not have to respect quick transition as much. Sometimes the Thorns can overcook the attack if it becomes too dependent on the attacking midfield. And that places pressure on their defense that their defense has trouble overcoming because they just don't necessarily have the pace in the back line that they would need to be dealing with another team possessing the ball and moving the ball forward against them. I'm sure everyone is hoping that Sophia Smith's injury is not too serious, but really fascinating. Portland, like it's, they just looked a little bit closer to the kind of teams that we saw at the beginning of the season, which is very talented. They do have a plan, but the plan simply just does not work so well. If you're no, if you don't have both Sophia Smith and Morgan Weaver, they are dependent on a few key players. Again, talk about MVPs, the, the V part, the valuable part. They look so much better with Sophia Smith. They'll be really happy to get her back hopefully soon. But I do still put them up in this top tier. I don't think that that winning streak was a fluke. But I do think that we have simply just seen some of the, the ills that could befall them if they continue to have issues with their availability report. And then finally, I'm breaking my own rule. I know I said top four, but we're actually going top five. Gotham. Putting Gotham up here. Gotham is a top four contender. They look increasingly comfortable every single game. They're getting contributions from a wide variety of different players. They are unbeaten in their last six games. Forward Ellis Steven is having a huge breakout year. The defense is looking increasingly sturdy. I mean, you talk about some of the depth points. They're having Emily Sonnet sit back there a little bit more as they get Davidson's availability back. I think you you see some of those signings against Stevens, Sonnet, even those players that maybe you didn't think were going to be the biggest creative attacking input or output players for them in the offseason turning them into a team that can put a lot of different players out and dominate and, and play quite well. I do think it's interesting that Crystal Dunn is coming off the bench more consistently. I think it's great from a team standpoint. I think she puts pressure on opponents late in the game that very much affect Gotham's ability to see games out. I think that's why we're seeing some of these things that maybe earlier in the season would be draws turn into wins. I think that they're utilizing their depth very, very well. 
But I am just curious if that's how she saw herself fitting into this group when she signed with them. And then, yeah, Sonnet at center back, I also think is interesting just in the context of her being listed as a defender for the U.S., going into this international break. I don't know. I, I will we'll have more to say about the U.S. next week once we see them on the field uh, for Emma Hayes. But, but yeah, I think Gotham is deep. I think that they are tactically nimble. And I think that they are going to probably be one of those contenders for top four finish. So if you're looking at maybe the, the most vulnerable team of this top five, maybe you do say Portland, even though they're still sitting in fourth. But I think that's kind of, this is kind of the, the gold standard, these teams. And it's not just the streaks. It's not just the wins that we're seeing. It doesn't feel like these teams are like surging. We're not seeing them drop, you know, four or five goals and having these amazing, incredible wins and they're steamrolling teams, but it's just the consistency. And that's how you make a good NWSL season, especially as we move into deep summer. So those are the teams that I think are going to be that top four mix. And so I just think it's kind of interesting because that does goes back to those days of the NWSL where you had maybe a top two or three where you're like, yes, of course, they're going to be at the top of the league. You know, you go back to your North Carolinas of old, your Chicago's of old, your Portland's, your Seattle's, those teams that sat at the top of the table so much. I think we're seeing something similar to that this season a little bit more, which is not bad because you can kind of go more in depth on those teams that are already executing quite well, though we do maybe lose a little bit for competition. Like I said, sometimes that does mean that the chasm is widening a little bit. The rain have a big problem. I think it's not for lack of effort. We saw a fight back from them this weekend, but still just not enough. They fall back onto a three-game losing streak, little relief in sight. So they they had this long losing streak. They finally get a win. They get a draw, and now they're back on three-game losing streak. I've talked about the rain in the past. I don't know roster-wise what the answer is, and I do not think it's for lack of effort. They just shut off in these moments, and, and, and they they have trouble coming back after shutting off on defense. Utah, again, with a 1-0 loss where the scoreline maybe flatters them a little bit. I'm really curious what the antidote for them will be in terms of roster changes. I think they're stuck until August, until the trade window opens back up. I don't know if they're having issues with kind of players wanting to move into that market or not. It's just hard to kind of tell what the problem is, but they are doing, I guess, a a nice job in in holding the scorelines tight, but just there's really nothing going on in the attack. And that puts so much pressure on their defense that even the sturdiest defense can't hold these teams off for a whole game. Gonna go ahead and say, now this is my, maybe the hottest take. They're still in playoff position, these two teams, but I am starting to worry a little bit about North Carolina and Chicago. North Carolina, I keep talking about how they've got it all there. They've got it all happening. They're making the chances, but they're just not getting the goals. Now we saw the other end of that, which is that over a series of weeks, if you are putting together these kind of really nice full team performances and you're not getting the results that you need, sometimes that's tiring. It, it causes mental lapses. We saw some defensive issues from them this week. And I think that that actually is perfectly natural and expected. If you have a team that is working so hard to put together these perfect chances because they don't necessarily have a natural goal scorer, that does creep have, have fatigue creep in over time. And so North Carolina, again, I, I don't know what they do other than again, go for maybe a big signing at the end of the, at the end or at the beginning of the, of the next trade period. But I don't know how they make their way through this part of the summer, especially as again, you start to feel sort of the fatigue of that lack of sort of opening the floodgates up in front of goal. And then for Chicago, I just think Chicago has become something of a bellwether team. I think if you've got teams that are struggling, Chicago does very well against them. I think you have teams that have more put together. And then I think Chicago against racing Louisville this weekend found a team very similar to them. And I think the fact that they lost this game is not a good sign. Louisville is a team that, you know, they, they have a couple key playmakers. I'm not always certain why they don't get some of their impact players involved a little bit more. But I think for Chicago, if they want to consider themselves a playoff team, they want to beat a team like Louisville and I think Louisville vice versa. And so Louisville getting, getting the edge over Chicago and Chicago is at home. I just think the Red Stars had this really nice start. They've got a lot of good pieces to build for the future. I said, I really liked what Lauren Donaldson is doing last week. And I meant that, but what does that mean for this year? And how do you start salvaging performances to build you for next year? if you start to lose steam as teams get more tape on you and the way that you like to play. So those are my two teams. I think are they're, they're in the warning warning zone right now, still in playoff position. And like I said, with, with other teams struggling as much as the bottom of the table is, maybe it won't matter, 
but you know, Chicago, they, they get six points against Seattle, which is great. But then you look at how Seattle's rest of season is goes and you go, okay, what does that mean after we see these early results? So hopefully those teams will be able to bounce back. But I also just think that Louisville and, and Houston who beat the courage, just put really nice performances together as every team will continue to do, because this is the end of USL and nothing comes easy. So real quick, I'm going to do a rundown, just like I did for the WNBA. Here's my way too early MVP watch for the NWSL. Barbara Band is number one. I think you can talk about availability. You can talk about goal scoring or defense or whatever. But Barbara Band is like the signing of the century. It would take a huge drop off, I think, for her to fall in the MVP race. I think there is a legitimate, I don't know what the Olympics will do. The Olympics always kind of gum things up. But I, I think that there is a legitimate chance that we see Sam Kerr's single season course goal scoring record fall this year, just with the pace that everyone is scoring. Croy Bethune, she breathes assists like oxygen. She scores on her own too. She plays in a system that allows her to be her best self. I think that she is top three and it's not three. Sophia Smith, again, didn't play this week, but talk about valuable. My goodness. Want to talk about her MVP candidacy. Look at the team without her. Essential. She, she is also a player that is, has always been able to assist at the league level. And that has continued. She's a goal scorer. She's an assister. And she is very important to their defensive pressing scheme. Tem Wichawinga, her performances has slower, have slowed in recent weeks. But again, talking about team impact and Kansas City's ability to grind out these results when they aren't always at their best, her ability to run the field and stretch defenses is so, so important to getting that breakthrough, even when they're not having their best. I think Trinity Rodman is having the best season of her career thus far maybe quieter because other players are also doing really well in this spirit system. But Trinity Rodman, God, thinking about where she was last year at this time, she wasn't starting consistently for the United States. She, The Washington spirit were struggling. The growth that Trinity Rodman has seen from last year to this year in a way that I think everyone always knew she was capable of has been really wonderful to see. She plays like a, a many year veteran. She plays like a leader. I really like what we've seen from Rodman so far. And then my my dark horse is Vanessa DiBernardo for Kansas City. A player revived in Blacko Adonofsky's system. Many, many years served in the Chicago Red Stars system. She's turned into an all-around midfielder through necessity. She can defend. She can pass. She can score. It's been really nice to see Vanessa DiBernardo do as well as she has done this year. So that's kind of my, my way too quick MVP watch. I think things will change once we move into this, this Olympic part of the season. We're going to see injuries impact things. We're going to see availabilities impact things. But we're beginning to really see teams carve out their place so far, moving near the midway point. And I think we're saying this, seeing the same thing for players. And what a year for attacking players in the NWSL. Just fabulous stuff. So real quick hits. Some some news roundup stuff. Barcelona wins the Champions League over Lyon. It's the end of the Geraldes and Bompastor era. Bompastor likely moving on to Chelsea. Geraldes obviously moving on to the Washington Spirit. Very fitting end. Barcelona, these Barcelona teams of the last five years will be discussed as the the lions of of, of women's football in Europe for, for many years to come. And even maybe this is a good pivot over to, again, we're seeing kind of the end of of these moments for these teams. Emma Hayes moves away from Chelsea. Geraldes moves away from Barcelona. Bon Pastor moves away from Lyon. We're seeing a reset and I, that I think is actually very healthy in European football. And I think that makes me excited to see how these teams maneuver to keep themselves relevant in the off season. Emma Hayes, again, famously moving on to the U.S. She did name her U.S. roster. Like I said, if you would like more analysis on that specifically, go to YouTube. She did speak to the media for the first time last week. The vibe is that she's focused on the short term before the long term. I think she really likes the double pivot midfield for the U.S. Expect to see more of that, but I think they're going to try to spring more attack from that double pivot rather than be overly defensive. I think there's maybe some hope here for Andy Sullivan, who was called in as a training player just this week. The midfield's a big question mark, I think, for me, for the U.S., and, and I'm not entirely sure what Hayes's big plans are, but I do get the sense that she has some big ideas for the U.S. player pool and the U.S. youth systems and, and development systems, but they're all going to take the back seat for the Olympics because the Olympics are very, very soon. PWHL playoffs. Minnesota and Boston will play a winner-take-all Game 5 in the Walter Cup playoffs on Wednesday because Boston saved their season with an overtime win on Sunday. I'm based in Chicago, Midwest all day. I'm a Minnesota fan, but I think Boston's story has been really compelling. Can't wait to watch these two teams battle it out for it all. I think that I love, I love playoffs. I love playoffs. Hockey playoffs are the best. You see teams get these upsets. Boston and Minnesota both upset in their semifinal, and I, I just love, I love playoff hockey. So if you get a chance to check that out on Wednesday, I highly recommend it. Shakari Richardson wins in the 100 meter at the Prefontaine Classic. If your memory of Shakari Richardson is mostly based in 2021, I want to give her a shout out and recommend you go look at her recent results. Very consistent runner right now, reigning world champion, 
looking very, very good going into the Olympics. The Women's College World Series is set for softball in the Super Regional Series. Last weekend, the biggest upset was Alabama over number three seed Tennessee. Number one seed Texas and number two seed Oklahoma, who are the reigning champions, are still alive. Uh, and then every other Super Regional, we did see higher seed wins. So I think that's going to be fantastic. Check out the College World Series again. Playoff softball. I love playoffs. I love playoffs. And then finally, the French Open is this week. Iga Sviatek is, the, is definitely the favorite. And she's the queen of clay. It would be a massive upset for anybody but Sviatek taking it all. But I do think you have to look at a player like Arena Sabalenka, who basically plays clay like it's hardcourt, and Coco Goff, who is again just turning into a very nice overall player who can play both on hard court and clay as the major challenges challengers and it should be a good one but yeah like i said sviatek is i think the heavy heavy favorite she does not lose lose at rolling garris often so this has been another edition of the late sub i am your host Claire Watkins. shout out to producer extraordinaire parker fenton next week look for more from us we're going to have some very big WNBA playoffs we're seeing some of these top rookies play each other for the first time cannot wait to see it we're going to have some u.s women's national team games so i always say obviously follow the late sub and subscribe to the podcast but i also recommend following us on youtube at just women's sports on youtube because we will be dropping in youtube exclusives from time to time and that allows us to get into true deep dives get into the granular of some of these women's sports teams because we're moving into a very exciting time in the sports calendar but if you just like listening to it through your ears catch us next week we'll have a lot to talk about